The Nigerian government says that even if we produce fuel in Nigeria, it doesn't mean that the price will be lower, saying that the price of fuel is determined by global market forces and exchange rates. Now, this means that Dangote Refinery will still sell fuel at a competitive price, even if the government is the only one buying from them. But Serap is calling on President Bola Tinubu to address the recent petrol price hike by the NNPCL, which they deem illegal and unconstitutional. They urge him to investigate allegations of corruption and mismanagement within the company, including a $300 million bailout and a $6 billion debt and threatens legal action if the government fails to act within 48 days. Now joining us on the conversation this evening to discuss more on this is Oluwashion Dania, energy expert and consultant uh, in the United Kingdom. And we also have Femi Oladei, oil and gas investment banker from Lagos, Nigeria. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us at this time. Good evening. All right, so let me begin with you, uh, Femi. Femi, if you, can hear, if, if you can hear me, can you say something, please? Yes, I can hear you. All right, fantastic. All right, so let me begin with you, uh, Femi. What do you think of the NNPCL statement about underlying market directions, you know, that local refining of petrol doesn't necessarily guarantee lower prices? Um, well, I, I think the, the, the NNPC um, probably might be a bit ingenious um, as to whether local refining um, should have the capacity um, to reduce prices. There are certain cost elements um, around the pricing of petrol or fuel um, that local refining should automatically remove from our equation. One of those cost elements is what I would describe as the transportation costs. So today, the NMPC imports crude from different refineries all over the world. It costs money to rent the boats, I mean, the, the super tankers that bring those, that crude to Nigeria. It costs money to lighter those super tankers into smaller vessels that, are, that can come to discharge in our narrow waterways. And it also costs a lot more money um, to actually then, you know, distribute that bulk purchase into tank farms um, before you then empty them into um, containers um, or into trucks that take them to the last filling station. So it's a bit ingenious of the NMPC to say that, you know, the local refining of products is not going to have an impact on pricing. That's not true. Um, there are additional costs um, that in the past, when we had the triple PRA template, mm. what that was equivalent to almost 10% to 15% of the cost of a liter of petrol that should be saved if we have local refining. Mm. All right, now let's hear from uh, Ulua Sheung. Now, what will it take for the NNPCL to reconsider its stance on local refining and also prioritize lower prices for Nigerian citizens? Uh, thank you very much. The situation has always been very simple, and that is local refining should give us low prices and we should be able to determine those prices by ourselves. Because this, the crude oil is a product that we have locally in very good uh, substantial, we have very huge reserves. We refine the products ourselves locally for our own local consumption, determine those prices by ourselves, and then whatever it is that we're exporting can be sold in global oil prices. And like uh, Mr. Femi said rightfully, the cost of logistics has always has also been taken out completely. Um, even as we were, if the government really cared about its people, what they would do, even though we, we are not able to get our own state refineries working, as we have the Dangote refinery, what we should be doing is sort of like a crude swap agreement, whereby they give crude oil to um, the Dangote refinery, pay them the cost of refining those products, and then they get all those products back. That is the PMS, the AGO, the jet fuel, and every other um, every other thing that can be gotten from that crude oil. That is something that the government used to do, um, I think, in the, in the 90s. They used to have crude swap, whereby they send the crude oil out to other okay. refineries outside the country and then they come back we collect our products back and we pay them for refining but all of a sudden all of those dynamics have changed and it has become you know sort of like rocket science understanding why we cannot determine so it's just simple terms you know i know back in the day there's you take your if you wanted to make more money or something you take your beans to the people who blend it they blend it and give you back your 
blended beans and then you go home and cook your moi moi. That's simply what we that's simply what we can do, even if we're taking it out and then we take out the cost of logistics. Mm. So simply it's not it's not rocket science. The NFPC can't do it. The government, if they are determined, they will be able to do it. Okay, so well, how, what about, you know, uh, the designation of uh, NNPCL as the sole off-taker of petrol from the Angote refinery? How will it impact the market and the refinery's profitability and sustainability? Oluwashio, still on you. Yeah, so, um, like, uh, there are different models that can be run. So, like that crude swap, the Angote will determine how much it will cost them to run that refinery. They charge the, um, they charge the NNPC you know, for refining the product on their behalf, and they get paid for that. Or the NNPC or Dangote, as they are currently doing, they are buying the crude oil off, they are buying the crude oil off the NNPC or wherever, wherever else they're sourcing it from. And then as a private, as a private organization, the NNPC or the country cannot determine how much they would then sell the refined products because mm -hmm. they are the ones who would then do their, their maths on how, you know, where it would be more profitable. Just like the NNPC and the government has always said that, um, Neighboring countries, it costs more. PMS costs more in neighboring countries. And for some way, uh, we're unable to protect our own borders. The Nigerian citizens are the ones who are suffering for it. So um, Dangote could always consider to sell his PMS to neighboring countries who are willing to pay more for it. However, um, energy sustainability is the responsibility of the government. And since we know fully well that in Nigeria, most of our operations, you know, we don't even have electricity in our home. So a lot of people, not just for cars, a lot of people depend on PMS for running their generators on a daily basis. A lot of businesses, you know, um, are fully dependent on these little generators that run on PMS and so much, so, other, so many other factors of our economy. So it is something that the government is supposed to take very, very seriously. Okay. And um, profitability for Dangote mm. is what they would always consider. But all these conversations, I believe they were the things that we had in the beginning whereby the NNPC was supposed to own 20% of the Dangote refinery, which would definitely be able to ensure this um, energy sustainability. But for some way, this new administration, you know, went back on that uh, agreement that was had. And then it has now become a fully private entity. All right, let's, let's hear, you know, the same question, you know, over to you, uh, Femi, talking about uh, NNPCL being the sole off-taker, you know, of petrol from Dangote refinery. How will it impact the market and the refinery's uh, sustainability and profitability? What Shen was trying to describe is something that's actually very common in the market. Um, crack spreads are what they're called. And basically, it's when you, you move your products to a refinery, and get that refinery to, to, to refine on your behalf. And then you pay them like a toll um, for refining. Um, what that does, obviously, is ensures that from a working capital perspective, um, Alaji Dangote doesn't have to go and spend millions and hundreds of millions of dollars holding crude stock, um, hoping that he would refine it and then sell for cash. But you see, the, 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 the key issue here has always been a transparency of pricing issue. The truth is that in the global market, there is actually a pricing template or there's a base cost price um, for refined products globally. Um, that price is always available on a two-way quote on systems like plats. Now, the two-way quote means that for every ton of, of PMS, um, there's a price at which it's sold X gates to the refinery. Now, what happens is that the NNPC should then convert those X gate prices into local prices um, and then sell. The reason why they're trying to designate the NNPC as the single um, off-taker of products from, from Dangote is simply because the government is still interested in controlling the base price of mm -hmm. PMS. You know, if they're not interested in controlling the base price, they would be completely indifferent when it comes to how do you price um, Dangote's refinery, I mean, how do you price products? Mm -hmm. Because if the price was transparent and open to anyone, then I can drive my trucks um, to Dangote's refinery and pick up PMS once I've paid him for the products. Um, but if the government is looking to still control prices, yeah. like it's done in the past few years, or well, like it's always done, then it has no choice but to be the importer of first resort or the buyer of first resort well, from Dangote. Well, 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 so many people are actually asking questions. Does the government need to be in control? I mean, they're asking if NNPCL will not be determining the prices, you know, since Dangote Refinery is a private refinery, why give them control? Why not sell directly to independent marketers? You know, that way prices will be reduced. 
prices will not be reduced if prices if products are sold to independent marketers. Nigerians like to play ostrich with things that are very, very apparent. What is clear is that the, the correct price today for a liter of petrol in Nigeria should be around 1,200 naira. Now, if Nigerians are ready to buy petrol at 1,200 or another 300 naira, then they should fight for the um, independent um, players to go and buy from Dangote. The reality is that if you want to buy prices, I am petrol at the prices that the government is selling today, the only way they can maintain those prices is if the NNPC plays a role of price of price control, which means that the heat that is coming between the price that Dangote's X gate prices are and the prices that are being sold at the pump or being sold at the depots, somebody has to write that check. Today, it's the NNPC that's writing that check. The implication of Nigerians pushing the NNPC to say, let everybody else come and buy, is that that check is going to become one that Nigerians have to pay. And if we're happy with that, then there's no issue. Dangote will sell at its plus, plus or minus, um, and anybody can go as long as they can provide him with a letter of credit and they can go and lift products from his refinery and they'll be able to sell at whatever price on the markets. But the same Nigerians are going to be the ones to go on the streets and complain that prices are out of the hmm. out of their control or out of their reach. So we, we have to decide what we want. Do we want low prices? Um, and then we have to live with the inefficiencies that we have today. Um, or do we want market prices? And then we'll start complaining the same way we're complaining about electricity. All right, so now you've heard, uh, you know, the question that Femi has actually asked, and he said that, you know, even if, you know, uh, independent marketers uh, have control or are the, if Dangote Refinery decides to sell directly to independent marketers, it still doesn't guarantee that the prices will be reduced. What do you have to say about that? The marketers plus Dangote Refinery, they're all in the business of making money. Hmm. So the bulk still lies on the, on the in the court of the federal government. How do we consider our people? What do we want our people? So the thing is, you know, when we're talking about you know global prices, we own these products, right? We are refining. We own it locally. If we're able to refine locally, we should be able to set our own prices for our own local consumption. And then later, if whatever it is that we are exporting, we can be considering you know global prices for same thing with you know other commodities that we have like you know food stuff you know the price of food in other countries are not the same as in nigeria because they do not have you know local but yeah not to not to digress the thing is it's the it's it's for the government the government's responsibility is to provide for its citizens the minimum wage in nigeria is far different from the minimum wage across the world in several other countries i think it's probably the lowest in this way, you know, uh, uh, in, in a lot now, of media. What, what about the implications of a monopoly, you know, in the fuel market? You know, uh, Ipman have actually complained. How valid uh, are their concerns regarding the NNPC's role in the fuel market? The current role that the NNPC is playing, as the NNPC has been the sole importer for quite, for quite a number of years now. Before that, the NNPC had been refining. I believe that what the NNPC can do is provide as a go the government generally provides security for you know companies who are producing locally if you look at the companies who are producing crude oil locally security cost of security is one of the most is one of their highest you know um operational costs there's one of the highest operational costs is security other things are also you know a lot of inefficiencies the logistics the amount that it costs you know to fix vandalized pipelines and all of all these things makes it really expensive to do anything locally. So the government should play the part of being the government. They should also ensure that um, since they're taking a huge chunk of most of, I mean, one of the, but quite a number of, quite a lot of the crude oil that's being produced from every oil field, the government should consider its citizens first and uh, channel some of that, some of that to ensure that citizens are able to live well, live properly, and then whatever costs that it is that uh, we're getting globally, if people are living well, they'll definitely be able to afford it. Okay. But right not it's right now with Nigeria that we. Currently, have I do not think people can afford the thousand two hundred or thousand five hundred for a liter of petrol, because okay. we're very much dependent on that product, and it's on the government to ensure that people do not um, people do not get pushed to the wall, essentially. Okay, um, uh, Femi. Now let's hear from you uh, about Ipman's concerns regarding the NNPCL's monopoly. What weight will it carry if ignored? And uh, are there regulatory measures that can be taken? 
So I, I want to respond to something that Sheon said okay, before I answer that question, right? You know, we, we, we Nigerians um, are trying to live like we're the same country that we were 20 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, the Nigerian population has doubled over the last 20 years, whilst the size of our economy has shrunk by 50%. So the continuous expectation that the government is going to be um, the savior for the Nigerian economy is a misplaced is a misplaced expectation. Um, the Nigerian government is broke. Mm. The Nigerian government is more or less borderline bankrupt. Um, and the expectation that we're still going to continue to subsidize basic products um, at this time, given where they are, our economy is, I think it's a it's a you know it's a difficult thing for us to continue to ask for. Um, there are subsidies in everything in Nigeria, from education to to healthcare to you know to petrol prices to electricity, and we're talking about a government that is the most inefficient um, allocator of resources. At some point, we have to realize that if we want this country to grow and we want this economy to grow in a sustainable way. The handouts from government are not something that we can sustain in perpetuity. Now, coming back to Ipman, Ipman and the likes have to, you know, accept the fact that as at now, the Nigerian government is doing what Sean wants us to do, which is that the Nigerian government wants to moderate prices. The problem with moderating prices is that Nigeria does not live in isolation. So all the countries surrounding us um, are selling petrol at the minimum of 20 to 30 percent higher than the Nigerian prices. And you are now asking the government to go and police borders um, when it can't even produce police the country itself, you know, where bandits and criminals are running riot and um, without any form of security. So I, I, I think that we need to create natural barriers um, to the leakages that our economy has. And one of the most important natural barriers is for us to make sure that our products are priced appropriately. Now, if the government wants to subsidize, the subsidy should go to the poorest of the people, which is through tax rebates, you know, or cash handouts, whatever it is they're doing. Um, but by having a universal price that is lower than the price in Benin Republic in Niger, we're just going to increase, encourage criminal elements to continue to steal our products and go and sell it in those countries. Fabi, talking about now, criminal elements, there's been, you know, talks about, you know, corruption and mismanagement within the NNPCL. Now, I'd like for, you, like for you to speak on the reported failure to remit oil revenues to the public treasury. You know, how, how, how has it contributed to the corruption and mismanagement within the NNPCL? Look, the truth is that when people talk about um, NNPC not not re re remitting money to the mm. federation account and all of that. I'm sorry, with due respect, I'm an accountant, right? And numbers don't lie. It, the, the NNPC in the last two years has subsidized petroleum products to the tune of almost 10 trillion naira. Where do we think that money is coming from? Are we printing it? No. Somebody is paying for it, and it's the NNPC that has been paying for it. So. If we, if we keep expecting that there is some miracle or by some miraculous intervention that the NMPC is going to be able to move money from nowhere and be able to pay the federation account while still carrying the burden of, you know, um, outrageous, you know, subsidy payments, then we're, we're, we're asking for the impossible. And that's where Nigerians have to decide what is important to them. Is it cheap of petrol or a government that is more efficient and gives us an economy that we can actually thrive within. So you're saying and that I'm you saying, don't believe that there's any mismanagement or corruption going on within the NNPC, is that what you're saying? Look, look, I don't think there's any Nigerian government institution that does not have corruption within it. But I think that the corruption we describe when it comes to subsidy payments is outrageous. It's not true. You know, the reality is that you can do the numbers right from your room and see the current market price of petrol is 1,200, 1,250. The NNPC has been selling at 600 naira. Multiply it by the number of liters that we've been selling, and you can see where the leakage is coming from. So whilst, whilst we can say that there is corruption, of course there is corruption. Nigeria is a corrupt country, you know, but the truth is the extent of corruption that we attribute to the subsidy payments, it's, it's overblown. There is a subsidy, it is real. Whether the NNPC accepts it or the federal government accepts it, that's up to them. That's their business. The reality is that today there is a major hole in the NNPC that has been occasioned by subsidy payments. And if we want that hole to disappear 
and make the company viable, we must encourage them to be able to sell products at the market price. And whilst if the government wants to push forward with a subsidy, we find alternatives. That's the reality. Okay. Now let's hear from you, Lua Shun, on the mismanagement and corruption within the NNPCL. Uh, the Serap has actually asked the Attorney General of the Federation to do its investigation, you know, uh, into the alleged corruption uh, within that uh, particular uh, organization, that's the NNPCL. Let's have your thoughts. I believe, yeah, like Premier rightfully said, the NNPCL can definitely have those allegations, but I, I don't think we need to spend, you know, time and energy trying to investigate and find what is not missing. Like you said, you can do the calculations from your bedroom. We've seen that the Naira has been devalued significantly and, you know, the product has still been selling at, you know, lower price, at a lower price compared to what, you know, our current um, FX is saying right now. So evidently, NNPC is bleeding and they're spending a lot of money. However, in terms of mismanaging those funds and reporting accountability, that might be where you can, you know, put some faults, uh, put some blames at them. But I believe for us to move forward as a nation, we don't need to spend resources and time we, what it is that we need to make a U-turn. You know, the government needs to be very decisive on what they need to do. We need to make an enabling environment that will allow people to be willing to build refineries locally. Pretty much, you know, close to we have um, organizations in this country that have built modular refineries. So all those are very smaller. Those are small refineries, probably producing just one product, maybe AGO mostly, and they're supplying the local the local communities around them. The prices are really sell. Yes, they are about the same price, but some of them, when they consider the cost of logistics that have been taken out, they reduce those prices for people who are coming to uptake from them. And people are able to make profits. So I know some companies that, you know, there's transporters, I mean, marketers that come all the way from Nasarawa and other places, all the way down to Portacot to buy AGO from them because they know that the price, the quality is good and the prices are different. So the government needs to work on ensuring that the create an enabling environment that's going to allow people to be willing to invest in, you know, refining locally. That is, they'll be buying directly from the producers at, of course, global rates, and they refine, and definitely, because of all the products and offsets that you get from like, the crude oil, they will definitely be able to make more money if they're able to sell at, you know, significantly, I mean, market rates, and gradually there'll be competition, and then those prices will start to see price, prices drop. Well, okay, but then, uh, you know, uh, the NNPCL has also, you know, promised uh, uh, not once, not twice, you know, to make sure that they bring an end to the fuel scarcity right now. So how will their promises uh, to address the fuel scarcity uh, that uh, we're witnessing right now translate into tangible benefits for ordinary Nigerians? Still on you, Oluwa Shion, and then we'll come back to Femi with that same question. As leaders, um, always need to sell hope to the citizens. So evidently, it's always important. I mean, if they, they spend money, they import products, and they always tell us that you have over 30 days of stock. You know, but of course, at some point in time, there's some scarcity, and then we start to hear what has really happened. But of course, you don't expect people to come out to say to start crying doom. They need to give hope. And we as Nigerians also need to, you know, brace up, understand where the government is coming from. If there's a lot of transparency, I believe that people would all understand and we ought to cut down on certain things that we are expecting. However, for the for 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 the products that we currently have, I'm not I'm not very certain that you know what we have will go around for very long, but that's why we're all, you know, hoping and praying that you know the refineries come on stream, the Dangote refinery is also able to produce locally and be able to distribute. If Nigerians can afford what is, what is coming, we, we, can only, we can only keep praying. Okay. All right, uh, Femi, over to you with that same question, you know, on uh, the promises to address fuel scarcity. And I ask that because some quarters seem to believe that there's a huge role that, you know, power dynamics and elitist interests actually play in maintaining impunity when it comes to corruption in the oil sector. Um, look, at the end of the day, you, the, the, the truth is that the Nigerian oil industry has been one of the most opaque industries in the last 50, 60 years since, since oil was found in Oloibiri in 1958. It has been one of the most corrupt sectors as well. Um, we, we must all remember that $2.8 billion was in 1978 um, or even not earlier. 
You know, so this is not a sector that just became corrupt yesterday. There's always been corruption there. And the reason why that corruption has been perpetuated is simply because the entry barriers for private sector um, or for, for alternative producers in those markets um, are very high. And again, it's only the elites that are able to play in it. Nigeria has had a criminal element or a criminal gang or a series of criminal gangs who have been sabotaging and stealing crude oil um, for the past 15 years and nothing has been done to stop them. We've not been able to stop them. Um, it was Abacha, um, the infamous dictator, who once said if there was if there was a I mean, crime being connect, committed or if there was an insurgency and for 24 hours it continued, it means the government is complicit. Mm. So what is obvious here is that there's a complicit government and there's also a complicit elite. Unfortunately, the average Nigerians are the ones who pay the price for it because the, the wasted resources, um, the, the lack of development in the country, and the ones who pay for it the most are the, are the poor Nigerians. Unfortunately, in the last three, four years, um, the number of people in multidimensional poverty in Nigeria has doubled, um, well, almost doubled from 68 million people to over 100 million people um, at the last data. So, so that, that in itself is a problem. And the only solution to it is something that Sean had alluded to when he was answering his question, and that is transparency. Nigerians have to demand transparency from the government, transparency as to what exactly has happened to our crude production. How did we go from 2 million barrels to today barely um, 1.3 million barrels? And what has happened to our production? Why has there been no investment um, to ensure that we're able to continue to um, produce from those wells? Um, and what, what exactly is the key driver um, for the future? Where are we going? What is Nigeria's future, given what has happened? Yeah, Are we Femi, going to wait until to get speaking, to five speaking million Speaking of the future, again? Femi, you know, there's so much excitement, you know, towards uh, uh, the Dangote refinery and what he, it has to offer. Uh, but can you tell us, are there any probable drawbacks of uh, the refinery's production capacity? Will there be? Look, there, there are some drawbacks. You know, one, one key issue that scares me is when I hear the nameplate capacity that the Dangote refinery has. It's 650,000 barrels of crude a day. Um, and that is significant production. Significant production, both from a working capital perspective for Dangote, um, as well as from a, from a capital intensive you know, perspective as well. So if Dangote was going to rely on the Nigerian banking sector, for example, to support his refinery, then I don't believe that the Nigerian banking sector has the capacity um, to maintain a 650,000 barrel um, made name plates capacity refinery. And to now juxtapose that against the platform of the NMPC's threats that it will restart production in the Portacot refinery and its other refineries, which have a name plate of 450,000. So basically, you're saying the Nigerian economy has about a million plus barrels per day of refining capacity. Um, that is significant. That should be positive. But one of the things Sean said that we must always go back to is that unless we can get production that we can sell to the outside world at prices that are slightly higher than the local prices, um, the only benefit we would have is availability of products um, without any benefits to the pricing to the average Nigerian. And I don't think that's what our end game should be. Okay. We should be looking at a market whereby we can benefit from the upside um, that comes from these refineries. Um, plane. So it's something I wanted to also mention that Sean had talked about are the byproducts um, from refining crude. Mm. One of the things people don't realize is that there are byproducts that come out of refining crude that are more valuable than PMS. Um, so there's NAFTA, um, there's AGO, there's um, you know ATK, which is what we know as kerosene. Um, there's also jet fuel. Those things are, are slightly more valuable than than and petrol than than the PMS that we are all obsessed with. And most times, um, this, these refineries are able to sell those products to the international markets where they're needed. Mm -hmm. And that has to be a benefit that we can look at in addition to all the drawbacks. Okay. Let's hear from uh, Lua Shewon on the drawbacks uh, with the uh, Nangote uh, refinery, probable drawbacks from it. That's their production capacity. It's, 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 <clears throat> so I always still have to look at it. It's, it's a private entity. You know, it's the, the probable drawback that we'll get from it is the fact that they would want to operate as a private entity, whereby it's for profit. Of course, they took loans, they took our loans in order to establish and build the refinery. The investors are expect, definitely expecting returns. 
So it will just be sad for you know that Nigerians will not be expecting to get low prices from a completely private entity. Um, some other things are that um, if Dangote is importing from importing crude from outside from other countries, it's definitely not going. It's definitely going to be looking to sell like all those byproducts. So they're looking to sell to the outside market, and they don't consider uh, you know local markets because we probably will not be willing to pay as much as what is being offered outside. So for the average Nigerian who cannot, who you know whose spending power is diminishing per second, it will be it will be it will just be it will, it will just be something that we we'll all celebrate and but will probably not reap any benefits. Of course, the other drug bags, the environmental impacts that you know we'll definitely witness within the region, but definitely is something that we also need to consider. But okay. uh, so far, so good. I think it's a plus. Come, come, if, we, if we look at the fact that you know our own state-owned refineries have not been very functional, but if we are going to the, how we then benefit from it so remains um, something that the government needs to work out. Mm. All right. Well, uh, let's uh, have your final thought uh, in thirty seconds, Femi. Um, look, the, the the truth is that the Dangote refinery is good for Nigeria. Um, Nigeria has to admit that we have to start to look at long-term um, price stability for PMS, which is a market-determined price. The government has a responsibility, as shown, as alluded to repeatedly, to ensure that the average Nigerians, the poorest of Nigerians, are able to thrive in the middle of that economy. And one of those is make sure that we have a living wage and um, also ensure that you know, where there are inefficiencies in the market that can, that can create price distortions, the government is able to fix those. Um, I think if we do that, then we can guarantee the long-term sustainability of the oil and gas sector. But anything otherwise, I promise you, we'll be having these conversations in five years' time. Okay. Uh, let's have your final thoughts in 30 seconds, Oluwashim. Yeah, pretty much. We are here already. All we need is, you know, government with political will to see that um, things are working as it, sh as it should be. There should be a lot of transparency to the Nigerians and the Nigerian people. I think that the government should put Nigerians first because that is one of their roles in government. Make sure that we are secure, provide for us, ensure that people are people do not people do not suffer. Even though, yes, there will be some people who need to pay the price in order to make for development. But it should not it shouldn't be this way. So the government should you know look inwards, ensure that we get things working. We do not. Need, I don't think the average Nigerian likes up to this. The average Nigerian is hardworking, you know. But people cannot go to farms. People cannot go to you know, there people cannot make a living. Mm -hmm. So as Femi has said, we need a living wage. People should be able to afford, you know, what it is, whatever it is that comes for us. We have we should fix electricity, fix so many things that are going to be beneficial to the average Nigerian. And as long as businesses do not solely depend on PMS and this thing, we shouldn't be having this conversation. Okay. This is 2024. There are so many alternative sources of power mm. that we can use and energy generally. Of course. Well, thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for joining me on the conversation this evening. Olua Sheundania, energy expert consultant, and Femi Oladeng, oil and gas investment banker. We appreciate you for your time.